Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Wow, super fun to see you. Especially Zoe. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Baruch Hashem. Is this your room at home? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> you. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me let in the other people. One second. Oh, this is so exciting. Oh my gosh, fun. Um, and hi, Anaya, how's everything? Good, Baruch Hashem, how are you? Hey, Baruch Hashem, doing fine, thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm really excited to be starting this class. This is a class called Halachic World, which I um, have given like I don't know, in different contexts in the past, uh, but basically the idea of it is to take random, practical, interesting halachic topics um, that, you know, that we, that we, we would like to look into and, um, and then just spend each session, once one, each session will just cover one halachic topic. I'll trace it for you from the like original sources down to the bottom line. We'll ask questions about it and, you know, and then like kind of finish that one. So, um, so today we're gonna talk about, um, can you buy a soda at an non-kosher restaurant or can you stop for the bathroom at an non-kosher restaurant? You know, that kind of question. Uh, Mars Ayan, right? Can you, what can you do or not do when, um, when people are, uh, when people might see you and think the wrong thing. Um, but I'm also very, very open if anybody wants to um, suggest, you know, uh, topics, like another topic that I've done in the past has been, like, what do you really need to put in Shamos or in Geniza, which is like a topic everybody is always asking about, right? Um, I was thinking of doing maybe next time, listening to music during Sfirata Omer, which is like a whole, you know, question that people are always asking about, and especially now there have been some new answers about it. Anyway, but if you have any topics that are interested to, interesting to you, like I'm happy to to put them in, so you can just let me know, uh, you know, if anything uh, if anything comes up for you that you'd like us to, uh, you know, to look into. Okay, so let's talk about Marzayin and Chashad. 
can anyone think of examples? I gave one, you know, as the title of this year, can I buy a soda at McDonald's? Um, but, uh, but are there, what, where has that come up for you, let's say, where you've wondered, is this okay or not okay based on the issue of married iron and Mars iron, as we call it? Any, any, uh, any ideas? Has this ever come up for you? I mean, has, have you ever had that question? Like, let's say when you're, yeah, go ahead. You know, it's actually interesting. Um, once in philosophy of halacha, Rav Klitzner was talking about, I don't remember, he was saying that like, he, he and his wife like would, like his family like would drive somewhere like up north where there weren't a lot of Jews, like to vacation, like on a, not like super frequent, but like, it, like that was like where they went. And like, he said that there's always this, like this, you know, junction where he would like they would get out and like they would like go to the bathroom and he said like when he went to the bathroom in the non-kosher mcdonald's he like dafka took his kippah off um because like even though he was just going to the bathroom and it was like way up north nobody he knew was ever going to see him um i mean he actually said that like the it would if somebody knew him then like it would be less of a problem because like they would we would know that he wasn't like eating mcdonald's but like he was worried about like, other people seeing a keeper wearing Jew walking into McDonald's and then they, they might think, oh, like, that's okay. Right. Okay, great. Yeah, like I think that when, when going on trips and things like that, I think most of us encounter this at some point where you stop at a rest stop and or you're or you're in a foreign city and you need to use the bathroom. And so you go into a, you know, you go into a, a non kosher restaurant because you need the bathroom, right? Um, but you, if you're identifiable as Jewish, right, then, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's an issue. Um, so the truth is, though, that there are other circumstances where people might like think you're doing something wrong when you're really doing something okay. Like, um, I don't know. I've sometimes been in a um, like. I don't know, let's say you. Would you say yeah? Yeah, like uh, yeah, shidduch situation. Like you, you, you are. I don't know. You are speaking with someone and like uh, people, like with a guy, and like or I don't know. They just drive you in a in a like you need to go somewhere and you are with a man in the car and people will think that you're together but you're actually not and like uh... right excellent okay so like that that kind of thing and that that kind of thing could happen in a situation where not only will people just gossip people might think you're doing something wrong like let's say you're both married to somebody else right um or one of you is married to somebody else um and so that you know that could be a concern where people might think you're doing something wrong or like, I don't know, you know, if you're ever in a store and they have like a satchel, you know, where you would put the things that you're interested in buying uh, or something like, meaning maybe, I don't know, like I've always told my kids, like if you have like a supermarket bag, sometimes I'm Rami Levy, I see this, like you have a supermarket, but you're only going for a few things. You have a supermarket bag. So you start like putting the things you want to buy into the bag just to carry them, right? Um, you know, and then you'll take them to the register. The problem is that it looks like you're stealing them, right? Um, and you have no intention of stealing them. You're planning to buy them, but it doesn't look like that, right? Like, right? Meaning, would you ever put something in your pocket in a shop just to hold on to it until you got to the register? Of course you wouldn't, right? First of all, I'd be worried I'd forget because I'm very absent-minded and I would for sure forget. And I think many people would forget, you know, something in their pocket. But but I think furthermore, even if you for sure not forget, like you, you might people will think you're doing something wrong. Um, okay, so, so that's, um, so that's kind of like the, the context we're going to see as we look at the sources, that there are going to be a whole bunch of, um, of, of cases um, where that might come up. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, and, um, and we'll have a look at the, uh, at the sources here, and you can see where this kind of thing uh, tends to come up. So Let's see if I can move up. Here we go. Okay, so um, so basically we have um, we have the the original source where this really comes up. Okay, with Gemara quotes. Okay, about this uh, topic. Okay, is uh, I just hold on one second. I want to just I want to be able to see you guys. So I just have to change things on my screen. One minute. Sorry. Okay, I'm so not good at this. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I've totally made it worse. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, 
done. Um, okay, so I uh, so let's have a look at this at the at the at the at the pasuk in Bamidbar, where uh, where this whole thing arises, and then we'll we'll go from there. So, um, someone want to read the pasuk? We'll we'll pretend we're like really in person together. So exciting! Who's open to reading? Sure, I'll read it. Yeah. I'm putting my neck on the line now because it's the only one with Nikudo. There you go. Beneath the shell, what? Oh, no, 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 no not yet. Um, <laughs> okay, beneath the shell, our sleep ne hasham, Vacher, um, Tashuvu, Avayitam, the Niki Nikim, Mehasham. Ume Israel, the Haitaha Arat Hazot, the Hem, La Achuza, Lifne Hashem. Okay, so what's going on here is that um, Moshe Rabbeinu, thank you for reading, is talking about, um, is talking to B'nai Gad and B'nai Ruvain. Remember the tribes that wanted to stay on the other side of the Jordan and didn't want to go into Eretz Yisrael, right? And at first Moshe thinks that they're like another case of the Miraglim and gets furious with them. And then he basically makes a deal with them and he says that if, as long as you are willing to fight along with everybody else, you guys are going to lead the fight to conquer the rest of, you know, to Eretz Canaan itself. And then you can come back and then that's fine. We'll let you have this land on this side of the Jordan rather than um, getting land on the other side of the Jordan. Okay. And the way that he says it, he says, Vihitem Nikim Me Hashem Um Yisrael. Okay. Um, that you will be clean or innocent from Hashem and from Yisrael. Okay. So what does that mean that you'll be Naki in, for Hashem and for Yisrael? Okay, um, so to be naki here means innocent, means like doing the proper thing. And it's trying to say, Moshe, the way that Gemara understands this, and we're going to see this later, is that there are two, there are always two different um, perspectives. There's the perspective of what you're actually doing, okay, which is the perspective that Hashem knows. Hashem knows what you're really doing, okay, and you're really doing the right thing. If you are going into McDonald's just to use the bathroom, you are not violating anything that the Torah said not to do, okay, but there's the other perspective, which is me Israel, right, that not only do you have to be naki in the eyes of Hashem, but you should be naki in the eyes of Israel, okay, that you should also look like you're doing the right thing. I say this approximately once a week to my kids, okay? Um, uh, when, you know, something comes up and like, I don't know, one of them, you know, did something that like looked to the other kid like he was doing something, you know, not nice to him. And he's like, I wasn't doing something not nice. I'm like, listen, like you need to be doing the right thing. And you also need to make sure other people realize you're doing the right thing. Not to pat yourself on the shoulder, but to sort of avoid issues and problems. Um, now, this is actually kind of interesting because why is it important for, I understand why it's important for Hashem to know you're doing the right thing, because like it's important for you to do the right thing, right? Like that's the perspective that Hashem sees is the actual truth, right? Why do you think it is important potentially for others to think you're doing the right thing? Why is that something that we would want? I can think of two different reasons and maybe you could think of more. Shoshana, you have an idea? Um, to like set an example for them. So if you're like portraying the lifestyle of an Orthodox Jew, you want like to show that in the best light. Okay, excellent. So one, um, one reason that you would want to be doing the right thing in the eyes of other people is so that other people, so to make a Kiddush Hashem, right? So that other people will realize um, that you are, uh, you know, like let's say in the case of stealing, for example, right? We don't want people to look at an Orthodox Jew and say, oh, that person is stealing. We want them to look at a, an Orthodox Jew and say that person is, is moral and ethical, right? And so having people think you're doing the right thing is important for the like, good name of the Jewish people of Hashem. Excellent. Why else? Maybe is it important for people to think you're doing the right thing? Any other reasons? Well, let's take what, what Rabbi Klitzner said, right? How did, yeah. Right. Like, um, that you wouldn't want other people to think it's okay. Great. Okay. Excellent. That is another concern when it comes, when, when something comes up like this, which is that if you are doing something, so stealing, everyone knows it's not okay. If they see you stealing, they'll just think you're bad and they won't think stealing is okay. Right. But 
Maybe there's a restaurant that is not clear whether it's kosher or not, right? It has hashgacha that's like an iffy one. I don't know if in wherever everybody lives, there are hashgachas like that, where like some people accept them and some people don't. And, you know, uh, or like it's a vegetarian restaurant, so some people eat there and some people don't eat there, right? Like, you know, whatever. And so if you walk in there to go to the bathroom, people will see you, the Orthodox Jew, walking in and say, oh, I didn't realize I was going, oh, right? And then they'll say, you know who I saw in that restaurant? I saw, right? And this happens all the time, right? Like, I don't know, like, people will always say to me, well, I saw this rabbi doing X, Y, Z, or eating X, Y, Z, or doing this, right? And so people say, oh, yeah, like, that make, that must be okay. Not, not that they're saying something bad about the person. They're actually learning from the person, okay? So, really, these two things, okay, these two issues of, number one, maybe people will think it's okay, or number two, people will think it's bad, and we don't want people to think you're doing something bad, right? Those are the two different uh, ways, those are the two different ways that, excuse me one second, I'm so sorry, hold on one second. Homeschooling. Um, okay, sorry. Um, okay, so the uh, Okay, so those are the things. So now let's let's try to look at it through that lens. Okay, and we're going to try to figure out um, how to organize the different uh, the different cases and examples and try to figure out what to do. So let's look at the Mishnah in Shkalim. Shkalim is the um, is a Masechet. Um, in uh, Moed, which actually, interestingly, does not have any Bavli on it, only has Yerushalmi on it, okay? So if you do Daf Yomi, when you get up to Shkalim, you will be doing some Yerushalmi rather than Bavli, okay? But in any, and it's interesting that, that made it into like the Bavli is like the Shkalim Yerushalmi, which is just kind of interesting, but there you have it. Um, anyway, so he says that in, in Shkalim, it's talking about um, giving your, your machatzir shekel, your half a shekel that we gave every year between Purim and Pesach, we, everyone used to give a half a shekel and that money would go to um, the korbanot of the following year. Okay, and Rosh Chodesh Nisan was the beginning of the fiscal year for Karbanot, okay? So they used to use the new money uh, from, from then. So if you're a Torah, if you're giving your money, I'm in source two here. A person who's giving his money cannot go in with a hemmed garment, okay, a shoe, a sandal, tefillin, or an amulet. Why? Why do you think if you're going to give money, you can't have any one of those things on you? So it says, Shema ye ani, vayomru me'avona lishkahe ani, Shema ye ashir, vayomru mitrumat alishkahe ashir. Okay, um, we're worried. All of those things are places you could hide something. Okay, you could you could slip, like a tefillin is a box that has a space in it, right? You could put, I mean, that would be weird from our perspective to open up your tefillin, but, um, but you could, uh, but you could, I guess, and maybe it was a bit easier to open up tefillin back in the day. Um, and so the idea being that you could, uh, that you could hide things and we don't want you to be able to hide, um, to hide any money. And then people will say, oh, you got, you know why that guy got poor? Because he had, um, because he stole from the, from the, from the Beit HaMikdash. And that's why Hashem punished him to be poor. Or he becomes rich and people say, oh, that's because he was embezzling um, all of that money. Okay. So Why? And the, the Mishnah continues and says, You have to be innocent in the eyes of the people the same way as you have to be innocent in the eyes of God. And then it quotes our Pasuk, And then there's another Pasuk in Mishnah, that's actually a pasuk that we're more familiar with, right? Because it's in benching, right? We will find favor and good thought in the eyes of God and in the eyes of people. So we are meant to be worried about what people think of us, okay, in terms of whether we're doing the right thing or not, okay? Um, which is really interesting, right? Because sometimes we say to ourselves, why am I supposed to care what other people think, right? 
Like, I know I'm doing the right thing. I don't have to care about what other people think, right? And Chazal are saying, actually, we don't agree with that. We think that it is important what other people think to some extent. Um, and we want to try to be, um, to try to uh, not only be innocent, but to look innocent, okay? Um, it reminds me actually, by the way, of like a, um, a trend in the secular world even now. You know how, um, you know, like a, a lot of office doors used to be uh, just, just solid doors, okay? And you couldn't see into the room when the door was closed, right? And nowadays, a lot more office doors have windows in them. Um, and that is, you know, partially a response to all kinds of, of accusations of things that happen behind closed doors, right? Of people saying that they were taken advantage of. Um, and I've heard people say, like, I've heard, you know, I remember like years ago, a man said, uh, you know, which was like a from, you know, man who said, who had an office. And he said to me, like, I don't want an office door that without a window because I don't want anyone to be able to say anything about me in the future that like, you know, maybe I did something that was not appropriate. So I want, like, I'm never closing my door or I'm always going to, or there's going to be a window in my door so that I will be Naki, not only in the eyes of Hashem, like I know that I would never do anything he was saying, right? But, um, but also that no one could ever say, because I could say what chance would I have had because of the, um, you know, because of the window. So that kind of thing is something that we are familiar with, not only from the, uh, you know, not only from like the world of Torah and mitzvah, but also just, uh, you know, just in the world in general. Okay, so let's have a look at some other cases in the Gemara of this issue, and let's try to come up with, I meaning uh, we're basically trying to get to an answer of like, can I go into McDonald's for a uh, soda or for a, or for a bathroom trip, okay? Am I allowed? I'm sorry, I just have a question. Sure. Um, um, when you said that the people came like with sandals or feeling, they had, they can hide something in it and it's a problem for other people, but I don't understand why. Why is a problem if he can hide something in it? Ah, because he was going in to give his money to the Beit HaMikdash. Okay. So he was going to put his money into the thing. So the concern was that if he came in with something that he could hide, something else in, he, when he went in to take money, oh, so actually, sorry, this, sorry, thank you for bringing that up because I realized I misspoke before. The Torah is not the person giving money because he's just giving his money. It's the person who is taking all of the, he's like um, um, taking all the money out of the box, okay, in order to count it and to, you know, and like the Kohen who's doing that. So he's basically the one who's like opening the stack of box and dealing with all the money. And if he goes to do that and he has a place where he could hide the money, then he could be accused later of stealing it. Okay. Right? But uh, what the name of this person is the Kohen or? It says Torem, which means... Ah, Torem. The okay. is, so the reason I got confused is Torem in modern Hebrew is the donor, the person who's giving a donation. But if, but actually, you're reminding me that the, that the, the case here is talking about somebody who is like the box got full and he is undoing the box. He's taking out all the money and counting it and get, putting it into the bank or wherever they keep it, right? And um, or we're going and using it to buy animals and it would be an opportunity for him to steal it, right? So if he's going in to count that money, he has to be careful that he doesn't have anything. It's like when you go into a dressing room, right? In a, in a fitting room, in a shop, right? What do they always say or often say? Do, do you yeah, not have like big bags. And... Yeah, can't bring a big bag. If you have a, a big backpack, they often will say, we don't want you to take your teak in there. They can't have a camera in the dressing room because that would be inappropriate. A person is changing in there. So they say to you, don't bring bags in, right? So because they don't want, because they, you know, it's a sort of, so it's like a similar thing to that idea. Um, that you can't go in with anything that you might steal with so that everyone will know like you went in with no, you know, like you came out with nothing. And so then you know that we're okay. Uh, okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, okay, so now we have um, an interesting case, okay, in Masachat Shabbat. So Masachat Shabbat, it talks about a person whose clothing got wet on Shabbat, okay? Um, so Misha Nashru Kelav Bamai, but Derech Bamai. A lot of times, have you ever noticed in the Gemara, rabbis sometimes meet in a river. Have you ever encountered that rabbis meeting in a river? Like Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, when they have their conversation about how Rabbi Yochanan should go to the base measures, and then Reish Lakish says back to Rabbi Yochanan, "Well, you're so good looking, you should you should be with the ladies." 
And then Rabbi Yochanan turns right back to him and says, well, if you think I'm good looking, you should see my sister. Come to the base Medrash and I'll introduce you to my sister. And that's actually how Rish Lakish becomes from. Anyway, and he does marry Rabbi Yochanan's sister. Anyway, so rabbis often met in a river. I don't know. I guess they waded through rivers from time to time in different, uh, different stories. So, um, so if, let's say, your clothing got wet, or maybe you were in the rain and your clothing got wet on Shabbos, you can walk around with wet clothing and there's no problem. However, let's say you get home and you want to take off your clothing. So you take off your clothing and you change into clean, dry clothes. What do you want to do with your, with your wet clothing now? You want to hang them out to dry. Okay, so, uh, you know, they didn't have dryers at the time. People would hang their clothing in the sun, like many people still do in Israel and maybe in other countries, okay, um, where you hang your clothes out to dry in the sun. What's the problem with hanging clothes out to dry in the sun on Shabbos? People think you washed it. Exactly. People will think you washed your clothes. Washing clothing is one of the 39 melachot on Shabbat. Milaben, you're not allowed to wash your clothes on Shabbos. Okay. Um, and so this is an issue. So it says here that you're allowed to put them in the sun, but not if people can see. And the Gemara immediately says, what? So the Gemara says, Amar v'yud amarav, kol makom she'asru chachamim mipnei marita'ayin, afilu bechadrei chadarim asur. One second, Rav Yudas is the name of Rav, that when something is not allowed because of Marasayan, you're not allowed to do it in private. You're not allowed to do something in private that would be not allowed in public because of Marasayan. And, and our, but our Mishnah says that you are. So the Gemara answers, Tanaihi, it's a machloket tanaim, Titania, Shotchan Bachama, Velokan Egeda Am, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon, Osrim. Okay, you are, um, there's a machloket tanaim, our Mishnah thought it was okay, but Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon said it was not okay. And Rabbi Huda in the name of Rav, Rabbi Huda in the name of Rav, Paskins, that if something is not allowed because of Mars Ayan, you're even not allowed to do it in private. What would you think are the arguments? for the two sides of that argument. Meaning, should if something is not allowed because of Marasayan, should it be allowed in private or should it not be allowed in private? What would you think? How would you pass in between these two opinions? It depends maybe which, uh, which kind of action because like you can, you can think, oh, I'm just putting uh, to dry, but so uh, you know what, maybe the behavior will change and you will want to wash your clothing or something. And so after you will, like you will go on a path that you go mm -hmm. to do an avera or something. So like okay, it depends so on the action. It depends on the action you think. Okay, what do you think, Tari? It also creates like um, like a sense of hypocrisy if you do that. Like you have one standard outside of your home where everyone can see you and then another one inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that's a concern that maybe that's actually not a good idea, right? Um, it's actually really interesting, meaning on the face of it, if something is, if you are actually doing something that is okay, right, and it's just about how it looks to the outside world, one could argue that if you're doing it in private, it's okay, right, because you know that you're doing something fine and no one else is seeing you, right? On the other hand, we have Tari's idea, which is that it, it might create a sense of hypocrisy. If you start doing something in private, you might start doing it in public. But secondly, what often happens when you think you're alone and no one can see you, or you think you're speaking privately and no one can hear you, right? What often happens, I'm sure many of us have had this experience, right? <clears throat> Where you thought you were alone, you thought you were having a private conversation, and then it turned out that someone else was listening, either because you thought you were on mute and you weren't on mute and your microphone was on. You didn't realize something was being recorded. You <clears throat> didn't realize someone was standing right outside the door, etc. You didn't realize someone was <clears throat> could see in. And so Chazal were concerned that if you allow something in private that you wouldn't allow in public, essentially it would not, it would not accomplish the goal of the rule. Okay, and if you look at the Shulchan Aruch, that's actually exactly how we pass in. The way we pass in, is that if somebody's uh, clothes got wet, he can walk in them, but even if no one can see you, it is not allowed. 
Okay, then the Shulchan Aruch says that's only if you lay them out on Shabbat. If you put your clothes out to dry before Shabbat and then they're sitting there uh, all through Shabbat, that's fine. I mean, and if you look at every, oh, like almost every Israeli household in the summer is like that. Like people put out their clothing to dry and then it stays on the line, you know, until uh, often and until let's say Shabbat, right? So that's definitely okay. Um, the, um, okay. So, um, the, um, the Mishnah Bura, however, gives us a caveat about this. And this is a very important caveat. He says that when we say that something that's not allowed because of Marisayin is also not allowed in private, okay, he says, the reason is, lo chilku chachamim betakanatam. The rabbis didn't make distinctions. Once we start making distinctions, all of a sudden, the rule falls apart, okay? By the way, we see that, uh, I feel like we see that even in the, um, like all the things about Corona today, you know, when, when everyone has to stay in their house, you have to stay in your house, right? When there's no minion, there's no minion. Now that like in Israel, you're allowed to have a minion as long as you're wearing a mask and the people are two meters apart, all of a sudden, you see all these minyanim where people do not have a mask and people are not two meters apart and they're doing Torah reading, which is like not allowed because two people are standing next to each other. And like, it's almost like it's so much harder to do something halfway, you know, um, than it is to just like not do it at all, right? Um, and like, you kind of can see that even in things that have nothing to do with religion that like a blanket rule, you know, makes more sense um, or is easier to follow than a rule where everyone measures it for themselves exactly where they want to draw the line. Uh, so, you know, that's part of what is going on here when it comes to a tekana, you know, of, of Chazal. By the way, feel free to jump in if you have questions, like as much as I know we're just online, like I do want this to be interactive. So totally like jump in, okay? Uh, okay, anyway, um, but then the Mishabura brings up a very important distinction. He says, Okay, this is a very fascinating distinction. The Mishabur is saying whether the prohibition of Mars Ayin applies in private has to do with what the level of prohibition we're talking about. If the concern is that they'll think you were doing a biblical prohibition, an Easter do right, huh? then it is prohibited even if you are in private, okay? But if the prohibition is an Isur de Rabbanan, like if what they think you were doing is a, a rabbinic prohibition, then you can't do it in public, but you are allowed to do it in private. Can anyone think why that? So I'll give you an example. Okay, the example would be like washing clothing or eating in McDonald's, which is like eating non-kosher meat, okay? Those are, or stealing, those are all biblical prohibitions. They would be prohibited whether in public or in private if you think no one's seeing you. But a rabbinic prohibition, okay, which would be like eating milk after meat. Okay, people saw you eating meat and then um, you buy a par of ice cream and you start eating the par of ice cream right after your salami sandwich. Okay, so in public, you're not allowed to do that because we're worried that people will see you, again, assuming they don't know that par of ice cream is a thing, whatever, you know what I mean? But in private, you're allowed to do that because it's, it's a durabanan to begin with to not eat meat, milk after meat. Why would you think there's such a distinction? Can anyone justify that distinction? What do you think? Why are we being more strict in private about biblical prohibitions than in private about rabbinic ones? After just saying that we don't wanna make distinctions. Well, the punishment isn't as harsh for violating rabbinic prohibition. Okay, number one, the punishment isn't as harsh, right? And, um, and I think like kind of taking that to the next phase, in general, we have a rule in, 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 um, in halakha that we make a gzeira, right? When we make a gzeira, 
we, I'm going to stop sharing so I can put something in the chat for a second. Um, oh, except I can't. Okay, one second. Um, let me just, uh, somebody had, what about impossible meat? Great question. Okay, that's going to be a great question. We're going to talk about that in one second. Okay, let me give you, um, so the idea of Xera, right, is that we have a, a rabbinic decree to protect from something, okay? There is a halakha that is Ain Gozrin Xera Lixera. Has anyone ever heard of that before? that we do not make one xera on top of another xera, okay? That's a rule, a rule in the Gemara. It comes up in many places in Shas, that if, if you have a rabbinic, a, a biblical rule, there will be a, a fence put around it to protect by the rabbis, a xera, to prevent us from violating that rule. However, if something is already a rabbinic fence, we do not make a fence around the fence, if you get what I'm saying, okay? The rabbinic rule is itself a fence. You don't make a fence to a fence, okay? And that is what the, what, that is what the Mishnah Brura, he doesn't use those terms, but I think that's what the, 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 the post game he's quoting are thinking. It is exera, right, to say that because of Maris Ayin, you can't do things Okay, in right um, that people that will look like you're doing something wrong, and it's already to say that about a rabbinic thing, right? Is already uh, offense around offense in a certain way, right? So we say that in public, but to extend that also to in private, when the logic wouldn't um, warrant it, would be similar to making offense around offense. Do you understand what I'm saying? Meaning you don't, like there's a, basically what the Gemara here is saying, which I th actually think is cool because it, it's something that I think we can relate to in a certain way, that there's always this, there's this desire in, in, in Halakha and in Chazal to protect, like when we're supposed to do something, we're supposed to do it. And we want to protect and protect ourselves from, from doing the wrong thing. But there's also this other side, which is like, just not making it too hard and not making too many rules, right? And so you have these counter pressures in the halacha, such as this, such as Ain goes ring zera like zera, which is saying, listen, like, we can't go that far, right? If something is already derabanan, we want to protect it, but like, let's have a, a limit to that, okay? Um, and that's actually quite fascinating, right? So th where you see this actually in the Shulchan Archives right here, in Source six, you guys can see my screen again, right? Yeah, you see where I'm highlighting? So in source six, the Shulchan Aruch is talking about um, power of milk, which has to do with impossible, which is like similar to Noah's question of impossible meat, okay? Um, and, uh, and that is the following. So it says, V'nahagula sot chalav mishkedim, u'minichim babasar of. They used to make, um, uh, and it's like funny to think about in the 1500s, but they made almond milk. I guess that was a thing then too, okay? And they would put chicken into the almond milk, okay? Ha'wil ve'eno rak means rabbanan. Because putting chicken and milk together is only a rabbinic thing. So even though you, um, you know, uh, uh, so, so, so it looks like milk, right? Um, but you're allowed to put them together, right? In your house and we don't worry about it. Aval basar behema, but if it's beef, which would be a biblical prohibition to cook with milk, right? Then you have to put yesh laniach etzel etzel achalat shkedim mishum arita ayin kemoshenit ba'er leel siman samach bavli inyanda. Okay, and he says, but if the if you are um, if you're eating beef with with that almond milk, you have to put some almonds next to the milk. Okay, now what's interesting about this actually is, um, is uh, so, so first of all, what's interesting about this is that the, the uh, well, let's, let's, uh, let's take it step by step. Um, this gets to Noah's question. When margarine first came out, okay, and non-dairy creamer first came out, the OU, okay, or the Rabbinical Council of Melbourne or the London Bethden or the Strasbourg Bethden or wherever, okay? Um, no, Perth, I skipped Perth. Okay, the Perth Bethden, okay? Um, 
would have had a rule that you had to have a little sign that says this is margarine um, or this or put the non-dairy creamer in its original container so that you didn't it didn't appear to be milk once margarine became something that everybody uses until it became something that everyone says not to use but whatever okay margarine has gone in and out in terms of gin but but uh but i'm saying right the the once people knew that there was such a thing such a thing as par of ice cream such a thing as par of butter right margarine such a thing as this you don't need any further to make that point so i would say about the impossible burger in answer to noah's question that I think that at the outset, right, um, it looks right. It looks exactly like meat, uh -huh. like it just looks like a hamburger. Am I right? I don't actually, yeah. So I think that, yeah. Look, yeah, it looks the same. Okay, wait, you're muted. One second, I can't hear you. Here, unmute. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it was like like I've like I've eaten Impossible Burgers before, and like it tricked me. I'm like, this feels wrong. Wow, wow, so interesting. So, um, so yeah, so basically the idea of this impossible burger, right, which is that it's like this, it really looks like meat, it really tastes like meat, it's actually par of. Um, and so putting, like making a cheeseburger out of that, okay, and like eating it in front of everyone, right, or even by yourself, right, I mean, it's interesting, right, is something that you're, is, is something that I think would be problematic because of my sign. So what you would need to do, is like have a little sign impossible burger you know like have the wrapper next to you whatever it is so that people can see um what you're doing um now um getting to i want to show you a very very interesting um uh Rav Moshe feinstein before we get back to the um back to the mcdonald's case of going to buy the soda or going to go to the bathroom okay i want you to um I want you to see, um, right, so first of all, this, this Rav Moshe in Source 9 um, is saying what I just said before, which is that he says, the Easter of Mart Ayin, who rak b'davar shana said, b'rov ha'panim p'amim ba'ofen ha'asur, v'hu oseh zeh ba'ofen ha'mutar. Mart Ayin only applies when most people are doing it in a prohibited way. Like if you were doing this, most people would be doing it in a prohibited way, but you happen to be doing it in a mutter way. Like for example, most cheeseburgers that are eaten in the world are prohibited cheeseburgers. You happen to be eating a few impossible burgers, right? That would be a case where it's considered marasayan. Okay, um, so most people who hang out their clothes on Shabbos because they're sopping wet did not like just happen to go through a river. They washed their clothes, right? Okay, and that's why marasayan applies to that. But he's talking here about like, men doing malacha during the 18 minutes, okay, uh, after the candle lighting for Shabbat, he says that, like, everyone knows that a lot of men, and in my case, women, um, don't always make it uh, to, to light the candles and start Shabbat in the 18, before the 18 minutes. And so it's, um, it's like not something that looks, uh, that looks bad. So driving during the 18 minutes, okay, which like half the men in a community might be doing, is not a problem, okay? Um, because it's not most of the time a sewer, okay? So that's what I was saying about the margarine. If most people, uh, you know, are most of the time when people eat some butter looking thing, right, after meat, it's actually margarine, then you don't need to be worried about that, okay? That, that the one person who hasn't heard of margarine will see you, okay? So that is a, um, is a limitation on the um, on the on the pro prohibition of marasine. But um, what okay. you mean is like if it's like if you are do if you are eating um, impossible burger, is it yeah. an issue of marat ain when most people will think that it's a, the wrong way, or they, if they will do it in the wrong way, they will say, "Oh, it's a burger with real meat and real cheese," and like, right. I'm not sure to, so, to understand what. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that uh, that that in a case like the Impossible Burger, because it is most, it will look like it is prohibited. That would be a case where you do have to have the wrapper like next to you on the table, so that anyone who sees it will understand that it is an Impossible Burger, not a real burger. 
okay? Whereas having coffee with milk at a restaurant, you know, uh, at a meat restaurant, now everyone knows, that, or having power of ice cream at a meat restaurant, like, no, no one thinks that you're that they're serving milk like ice cream. Everyone knows that there's such a thing as part of ice cream, even if it's not really great, in my opinion. But you know, everyone knows that it exists. So, like when they serve you that in a in a kosher restaurant, no one's going to think. So it has okay. to do. So some of it has to do with like changing times, right? Uh, like in the time of the Ramah, most people didn't use almond milk, so like it was confusing. But now it is not confusing. Okay. Okay. But I want to show you something cool um, in the Igra Moshe because it's very fundamental. He makes like a kind of a very interesting fundamental point. Um, he talks about here, he says, Mr. Okay. He wants to make a distinction between Maris Ayin and Chashad, and we mentioned this at the very beginning in our conceptualization of the topic. He says, the prohibition of Chashad is a biblical prohibition. It's learned from a Pasuk. And it's that you're not supposed to do things so that people will think you're doing something wrong. Okay? But then he says, when it comes to Maris Ayin, he says, Maris Ayin, Chashad, Okay, um, so he says that the prohibition against Marit Ayin, right, where people will think that you're doing something wrong, as you're doing something right, and they'll think it's mutar, right? Um, you need that as a rabbinic prohibition to not mislead people, okay, to th into thinking that you are doing something that is okay, right, when it's really not okay. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the, uh, that's the issue, okay? Um, then he says, excuse me one moment, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so, um, okay. So then he says, um, so he says, um, sorry, there's one in Yana Marit Ayin, okay? Uh, but then he says that there's a second Marit Ayin. V'chen yesh Marit Ayin, shal v'lo yach shadu klal shu over alihem, v'im echad choshed hu adra ba'osa isur de choshed b'kshirim, aval mikom hukom asru, shlo yeh makom l'baalei la shenhara l'daber alav, o shaharotim l'hakel yomru b'chavana. Okay, so he says, he says like very interesting. He says, there's this idea of chashad min Torah, okay, that is that you should not do things that look bad, okay, um, so that people don't suspect you. Then he says, and that's the right time. Then he says, there are two kinds of marit ayin that are derabanan. One is that um, people will think you're doing something okay, right? And the other is that, um, is that you're really doing something that would not really look, like it wouldn't rise to the level of the case in the, in the Torah, okay? Um, where it really looks like you're doing something wrong. But people who like wanna say Lashon Hara will talk about you, okay? And so he says that um, that those that like kind of it's almost like there are within Maritain there are the two different ideas that we talked about the kind that uh, people will think you're doing something mutter and the kind where people will talk about you as though you're doing something asur right and those two are uh, there are like those two could both be bidirabanim and then there's a different level that's the daraita which is um, which is that, um, which is when you are doing something that really looks bad, okay? Um, like, like going into a, um, you know, going into a place with money and, you know, with a big bag, right? And coming out with a full bag and expecting everybody to think that you're doing something okay, right? That's different from where you're not visibly doing anything wrong. You just, it just, 
people might say, oh, like you went into an Ankosha restaurant, right? You, uh, right, maybe you were buying a cheeseburger, but they didn't see you eating a cheeseburger. You know what I'm saying? So like, it's almost like if you were to take your kosher impossible burger, go sit in McDonald's, right? Okay. And, um, and then, uh, you know, and then, um, and then eat it in their window, right? That would be like a great case of hashad, where you're like, oh my gosh, you're totally doing something that looks terrible, right? Walking into the non, the non kosher restaurant, potentially to use the bathroom, might be a sewer from the Marit Ein perspective, Mizra Rabbanan, right? But would not rise to the level of hashad. So, Rev Moshe, just to go back, you know, to continue the line of thinking of his line of thinking here, he says over here in source 10 about, um, okay, when, when he's talking about, he, he's talking about uh, non-kosher restaurants, first he, in source 10, he's asked, he was asked if you can eat things there, and he says, don't eat anything there, you know, there are all kinds of different conscious problems, but then he says um, that he says you shouldn't even walk in to uh, to that store in order to eat things where he know where, where you know are okay. Like for example, you shouldn't even walk into McDonald's to buy a soda or to use the bathroom. But he does say that if it's a case of great need, okay, if he's mitzvah the air tuva, if he's very uncomfortable and it's a great need, then you can go into that place. He's saying in order to eat things that are allowed, okay? Um, I think the case that we're thinking of is more a case of, um, you know, uh, a case where he is, uh, like, needs the bathroom, and that would be the case of great need. You are allowed to do that, okay? Um, in a situation uh, where of great need, you are allowed to, okay? Um, and then he says, uh, as long as there are no people there um, who know him, um, and if there are people outside who know him, he should tell them, oh, I'm just going in here for the bathroom. You know, I'm not going in to eat here. Okay. So essentially what Rav Moshe Feinstein says, and this is like what the general psak is about this, is that if you're on a street in Jerusalem, okay, and there are 10 kosher restaurants and one seafood place, okay, um, and uh, you need the bathroom, Okay, don't go into the seafood place for the bathroom, right? That is going to look really terrible. You have many other places to go, right? If you're, and why are you choosing that place, right? But if you're on the road and there's, you're up north or there's, uh, there, or wherever you are and there's a rest stop and you have a, and you need to go to the bathroom and there's one place to go, right? Then you are allowed to go in there in order to use the bathroom because it's a case of great need and because people know. I think I would just add, the Rav Moshe doesn't mention this because he's not talking about this case, but I would just add, the average person going into that McDonald's at the rest stop, probably half the people are going to the bathroom. It's a rest stop on the road, right? You understand what I mean? Meaning that's actually what people do there. So I would say that's even more of a case where it would be allowed. But like, let's say you're in some, I don't know where, it's not a rest stop, but you really need the bathroom and the only places are not kosher. I think that the same thing would apply in terms of uh, in terms of allowing that in a case of need, um, you know, because we are we're not talking about sitting and eating a cheeseburger in a way that looks right in McDonald's window, right? We're talking about going into McDonald's where there is a possible way to do it in a permissible way, even though most people going into McDonald's are going to eat. So therefore, um, in a case of great need, because it's a Durabanan case, we are allowed to use the bathroom at McDonald's when there is no Choice, when there is isn't another uh, normal choice. Uh, okay, questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about like buying a Coke at a McDonald's, like a bottled Coke that is kosher. Yeah. Um, right. Like, what's the difference between going into like a McDonald's to get a bottled Coke opposed to like going into like a Macaulay, like a corner store where like you know not in Israel but in most other places, most of the things in that store aren't kosher. But like, right. no one would be like, oh, you're not buying Coke. Like, what? like I'm going in to buy a Coke. That's kosher. Right. Though half the other things aren't, most of the, like most supermarkets, half of it's not. Right. What's the difference? Great question. Great question. So I think that the difference is that, that, and this will have to do with like, kind of what is sold there. You know, the average person going into McDonald's is going to buy the fast food that they're selling there. 
the average person going into the supermarket is going to choose amongst the many, many things at the supermarket, right? And there's no reason to suspect that they're choosing the non-kosher things. I think that there are cases now where like, now you have shops that have all kinds of like restaurants in them and I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, so there could be hybrid situations where, you know, people go in to different shops to sometimes eat and sometimes buy other things. And if it's that kind of thing, like, I don't know, you know, uh, an Ikea or something that has a restaurant and also sells furniture. So I don't think you have to worry. Most people going into Ikea are going to buy furniture and you don't have to worry that people are going to think you're eating in the Ikea, you know, whatever. But in McDonald's, I think still in all, most people are going in there, you know, to buy the fast food and that's why it, it remains an issue. Um, you know, if, it, if that changes, if like, I don't know, McDonald's is known as the best place to buy, you know, cases of soda and that's, and people are all walking in and out with that, then maybe that would change, right? Uh, you know, but, but I think it's because of the, the, the nature of the, of the place and okay. what most people do there. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, topics that you're interested in for future lessons. Do you want to do the Spirit Omer music next time? Oh, yes. Uh, really good. Okay. All right. Let's do that one. Okay, music during Spirit Omer it is. All right. Looking forward. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great you day. Too. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Really Thank good you to so see you. Much. Okay. Shalom. Shalom.